Hey everybody, welcome to TerraVita HQ. I'm super excited today because we're going to meet the co-founder, CEO of, of TerraVita, Jason Watson Todd. They're a landscape designing company. He's led the way for nearly 20 years, innovation, design, creativity, looking at some of the challenges we face. We're going to talk about them today, so we're going to learn. Let's go have a look and listen to what Jason's got to say. Welcome back to those of you who subscribe to the channel and to those of you who, who are new here. Welcome. I'm here today with CEO and co-founder of TerraVita, Jason Watson Todd. Very inspiring guy for me, true innovator. We're going to talk about sustainability, design, and I'm sure much more. So yeah, let's, hello. Hi. Yeah. Hi there. <laughs> Thank you for welcoming to your office. My pleasure, pleasure. Um, so I guess we'll start at the beginning. It's all good interview seem to, you can't really avoid, <laughs> um, yeah, getting into sort of where, where you're born, where you grew up those influences, experiences that sort of led you to Terra Vita? Yeah, well, I was born on Ibiza. Uh, I was brought up by, uh, well, in the hippie community. Uh, my parents came here in 1962 when there was pretty much one paved road on the whole of the island and where people were still going around in horses and carts. So they, they came at, at a very magical moment uh, in the history of Ibiza. And they actually came on a sailing trip and never left. They were sailing around, kind of around the coast of Spain and they kind of made their way to Ibiza and thought this place is absolute paradise. <laughs> and, I'm sure. And, uh, and never left. And um, yeah, well, I was, I was born here and had a, an unusual and unique childhood. Um, for example, uh, at home we had... Uh, I had no electricity. I was brought up with kind of candles and those old kind of wicker lights and things like that. Uh, running water was a, a privilege. It would work at times. We had sometimes one of those hand pumps where you had to pump the water with, with your hands and pump it onto the roof and then it would come down through gravity. Things like that. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> kind of, a, it, it was, it was, we were living the end of an era. It was like Ibiza hadn't changed in, you know, probably 2,000 years. Mm. And we were at the, at the end of that era and the beginning of a, a new era on the island. But in those days, it was, it was absolute paradise. Mm. Uh, the childhood that I had was kind of like unique and very grateful for it. It was wild, um, a bit unruly at times. Sure. Um, I remember I have these distinct memories of going camping with my friends and, uh, you know, saying to my mum, I'm off, mum, I'll see you in a couple of days. And that was that <laughs> I was nine years old. And to think of, you know, that uh, yeah. this day and age is like, it's, it's, it doesn't kind of, doesn't compute. Mm -hmm. But it was kind of, in that time, it was, there was, it was just, it was normal. Uh, there was a feeling of, total safety on the island. You, you, you didn't have to really worry about your children. So we lived in a kind of a very tight-knit community and would often go over and, you know, spend a couple of nights at a friend's house. And and you, you'd say I'll be back in one or two days because there was no telephones. <laughs> Mobiles didn't exist in those days, but there was no kind of, you know, the classic telephone in, in oh. the house. There was no landlines, oh, wow. things like that. And most homes didn't have electricity. Mm -hmm. Uh, food was very basic. Mm -hmm. um, we had none of the luxuries that we had these days. In this day and age, I remember quite often opening the fridge and there was pretty much nothing in the fridge. But but I was still very happy. Mm. And I also have these distinct memories of um, coming home and the, the the neighbor leaving a big box of fruits and vegetables, kind of little wooden crate in front of the door, and that was a common practice. People would really help each other out in those days. There was no money, mm -hmm. hardly anybody. In those days, there was no wealthy people on the island. It was mm -hmm. very, there were maybe one or two people who were wealthy, but it was mainly to do with people who would, I reckon, probably had left, you know, the, the, after the Second World War, the, 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 the children from, from that era kind of decided to kind of leave either Germany or England. In the case of my parents, my mum was, my mum is German. My father's uh, uh, was English. And they kind of wanted to get away from that and live a, 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 a new life, and they did it. And, uh, and 
eternally grateful for, for them having the courage to actually, Absolutely. you know, leave the kind of the mainstream way of doing things and, and offer us a, a very unique way of living. Mm. Um, I mean, fascinating, unique, like you say, hard for me to quite understand but you're giving me an insight to how the world uh, or how Ibiza was then yeah so um and I can see how humble beginnings but open expansive beginnings could lead you to be what I see as a, as a sort of visionary and certainly very very creative um yet following a, a you know a, a path that is maybe a little bit more um a business orientated mm -hmm. and and so you balance both so I'm interested yeah. in where that that sort of balance came in well I think that the creative side was is very much influenced by my by my childhood and, and how we used to and how we used to live um, and just mainly being outside most of the time so kind of being in contact with nature <clears throat> and then kind of at one point when I went to the UK to 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 study I didn't really know what I was going to do and I thought I'd become a, a, a carpenter or, or, a, or a gardener you know uh, and in the end I kind of fell in, in love with landscaping and uh, from that, that's how uh, Terabita was actually founded, as a, a as a landscape design, a landscape design and construction mm -hmm. um, company. And from there on, it's just evolved over the years into my passion for the environment, to you know, it, using uh, renewable energies and just trying to do things the best as possible and always innovating. Mm -hmm. I think you always have to keep on innovating. You should never stop. Hmm. Yeah, so I guess that's an interesting thing, and that's probably what I see about you, and I'll, um, maybe you can explain a bit more about that innovation, but what gives you that get up and go now with Terravita? What is that thing that wakes you up? What is that part of the business that you find the most fascinating, or maybe it's technologies, or maybe it's ways of working? Is there... I find, I find, I think, for example, technology, I think technology is is a double-edged sword. It can be used for great good and for great evil, and my focus is you know, for, 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 the, for good. And I think there you can work absolute magic using technology to your advantage with that kind of that creative side and that human side of just trying to do things in a, in a respectful and a coherent manner and, and kind of thinking of or having always nature in the background and, and just it's not just all about money. And I think that's where we've kind of lost our path. It tends to be these, this day and age of how much money can we make as if the happiness lies there, but it, life's much deeper than that. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just finding that balance between all of those those aspects, and that's super important. Yeah, and I think that's what really attracts me to you, and I think about my brother and I's journey with, with a typical real estate business mm -hmm. and the connotations that come with that, yet we feel um, yeah, we have a, a different view or than, than that, you know, that, that people may consider us to have. I mean, we have a um, a cafe in, in London that has mm. strong, you know, ethics and strong um, visions for sustainability, regenerative, mm. um, where we source things are very intentional. And so we but we understand the real challenges with that, where people say I'm a sustainable business. But that is so um, it is challenging. Why depth and deep? I mean, it's, it's, it's almost an endless quest. It's challenging, but it's also inspiring. I think sure. it just gives it if you feel you're doing that, there's also a greater good behind your business. It's not just about making that quick buck, but also having fun doing it and, and doing the research into the sustainable aspect into sourcing and giving the, you know, the, the client the, the, the best possible service, but also that at the same time it's, it, it's got an interesting twist to it or it has an educational twist to it or you can, you can just show, thing, show someone that it can be done in a slightly different manner. And, and that kind of keeps you, well, in my case, it keeps me, keeps me going. It's fun. I, I wake up in the morning and and I'm inspired, mm. I'm inspired of what new materials can I use? Uh, um, how can I give it that, 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 that different focus and, and uh, how I can fuse certain things together. I actually have a, within the company, have a, 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 I call it the Green Committee. And we meet once a month in the Green Committee. It's just basically brainstorming of ideas of how we can um, either uh, work with a new, new interesting material, or what we can offer our clients, or or or, or how we can you know run the projects in a more efficient manner and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it's never ending. It, it, it it's it's a non-stop thing. 
I love that. And so that so this is a passion that runs through the team. I guess mm. obviously it starts with you or is, is a, a clearly a big passion of yours, but you're, you, you see that run through the team. And Yeah, it definitely runs through the team. I think team is key. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, I'm nothing without my team. And I, I, you know, I pay deep homage to them because they're all absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. And they all, they all really go for it. They, they come to work and there's, there's that real feeling of passion. Mm -hmm. you know, that sometimes I have to say, you know, guys, it's time to go home because mm -hmm. they're not even aware of time. They're just enjoying their job mm -hmm. and doing the best possible. And I've always tried to create that, that vibe where it's fun and pleasant to come to work. And that comes from an experience that I had in, in the UK where I was in a job that I really disliked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was uh, something to do with me, but also with the way the company was was run and it was just a very unpleasant environment and I thought you know if I ever run my own business I'm going to make sure that I create an environment where people are get people are happy where they really enjoy their work and they're a lot more creative and a lot more productive when it's when, it, when it's fun and there's a bit of passion to it instead of it's just a nine to five job it's it's more than that in the end how we spend a vast amount of our lives working and it's got to be fun it's got to be a pleasure Otherwise, it's a, quite sad that, you know, it's just, just work and that's it. It's, uh, it's music to my ears here, and you say it. I mean, it's definitely a similar um, ethos that we have, and it's led by a similar experience. Experience something in London, um, business being a certain way, found that quite conflicting um, and, and um, stunted me oh, personally. Yeah. So when you, you get an opportunity, and it was an opportunity at Rose to, to, to run your own business, yeah, a big driver for us is fun, teamwork, mm. exploring the potential of each other and ourselves. And it's a, it's a tool for development and all of those things. So it's, it's, it's really, really great to, to hear that's a, a similar thing for, for you guys. Um, and going back to your sustainability outlook, goals, um, innovation. I wonder how important do you think that is to your clients? You know, how important, you know, has it grown in, in importance? Um, very, very good question. I mean, I think when I first dived into the, the uh, sustainable aspect of, of business or sustainable world, I dived in in a very innocent manner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I thought, you know, <laughs> I could work miracles in, mm -hmm. in, in a year and I, I'm 22 years down the road and I'm still chugging away at it. It takes time to change um, c certain habits that we have as, as, as human beings. It, and um, it's, it's been more challenging than, than, I, than I thought it would be, uh, a lot more. Yeah. But I never, I never kind of give up. I think it's super important to keep that, to keep that, that, that aspect going. And then obviously on the, 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 on the kind of the environmental side, the, there's always that, that extra cost factor. Yeah. But I think that our mindsets are changing. Now you can, okay, maybe you can buy, a, a, for example, a bicycle that costs you 100 euros, but you can buy one that costs you 500 euros. And the one that costs you 100 euros is going to last you a year, you know, and then you have to chuck it away. And the one that costs you 500 euros is going to last you 20 years. So it's actually kind of, false economics thinking that you know you're you're it's you're saving money because ultimately you have to buy one every year <laughs> absolutely over a 20 year absolutely. period when you could have bought one and you you've spent a lot more money but we all have that kind of that difficulty to spend that extra buck at the beginning and that also it does on for example on the building side or the design side the types of materials you, you use it can be at times a bit challenging to convince a client to spend that little bit more mm -hmm. Um, but I do think that's changing slowly. I think we're, we're becoming more aware of the importance of sustainability and that things can that that things should last a long time. Mm -hmm. It's like spade, for example, a gardening spade. You can buy ones that cost you twenty euros, but you buy one every six months, or you can buy one that costs you one hundred and twenty euros, and it will last you your life, you know, mm -hmm. your lifetime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, actually, I think it's that long-term thinking that. It's just not wired in. Um, certainly, what coming from my upbringing, it was there was a short-term feeling of, of of how we were brought up or how what we um, just not connected. I think well, part of it is just not connected to to our actions and where they lead. And I think that's been a big shift for me is just like becoming aware of like my actions, what 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 the repercussions are on that. And then I believe people start to make different choices. So yeah, a big part of what we're doing is is, 
He's trying to educate people, connect people yeah. to you know sources like you, who yeah. clearly are well read, understand, have explored a lot, hit a lot of dead ends, I'm sure, yeah. um, but are coming up with some with some answers and solutions. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's 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 uh, it's a process. I don't think we're going to fix it overnight. Yeah, I think it's a process that takes decades and decades, and we're we're, we're still evolving mm -hmm. as 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 human beings. We're, we we it, the changes that we've gone through in the last. Hundred years are just it's, it's mind-boggling, mm -hmm. literally, mm -hmm. um, and that we're just trying to catch up. I think it's well, things are moving at such a fast pace; we find it difficult to keep up with it. Yeah, and that's a bit that's a bit scary. That it, <laughs> that bit it is. It definitely is, and I think that's a yeah question. Maybe you know you've born here, seen the paradise, the simplicity of paradise. Some will deem it to be paradise now, but certainly in a completely different way. <laughs> I'm interested to see what you think are some of the big challenges the island faces. Um, yeah, what? Um, the challenges the island faces. I think that the, the environmental policy is very weak. Mm -hmm. I think that there there has to be a real kind of a long term vision as to how this island can become sustainable. And I think it's actually quite easy. Mm -hmm. It's it's easy to demonstrate what can be achieved on a you know island that's 500 square kilometers. You could put certain practices in that that we could see the results quickly, mm -hmm. but that requires a, a, a plan, a vision, mm -hmm. and, and someone to put that into motion. Mm -hmm. And that I think is a little bit weak on that side. Maybe it will change, but uh, at the moment, it's it's. I think we've still got quite a long way to go. Yeah, that that's a nice place to look because uh, a lot of the responsibility falls on you know people look and what can I do and and there are things you can do but also there's a big you know there's got to be a vision there's got to be a collective movement yeah, exactly. because there has to be a vision and it, it the action obviously it has to start on the individual level but there also has to be a kind of a collective um, vision of where we want to to to, to get to mm -hmm. and and to put that in to practice. And it doesn't matter if the government's changing, you know, if it's the left or the right, but at least that there's a general, you know, kind of road that we all want to go down to, and it can it can veer off a little bit, mm -hmm. which is natural, but at least we want to get to that point. <clears throat> yeah, because there's plenty of signs to see the road that we're walking down is causing, you know, detrimental impact. The, the damage is, mm. is astronomical. Yeah, and I do feel that. We're at the stage where if we don't mm -hmm. get our shit together, we're, we're in serious trouble. Yeah. And uh, but I do see little changes. For example, in, in my kids, the way they speak about the environment, they're a lot more aware of it mm -hmm. than kind of my generation was. Mm -hmm. And 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 at the, maybe the education system there is kind of helping them understand of the, the impacts that your actions have on the planet. That's inspiring. And I think that can't be underestimated because they are the future. That's a saying that's said, but I think it's a literal truth. My daughter as well, when I see that, I mean, and, and, and my generation, there's enough um, awareness around it and want for it to change that we're more just sort of like um, uh, tending to what we can, but really create space for these young innovators because yeah. there, there is innovative ways out of this. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm, we're, 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 you know, we can go to the moon. We're, 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 <laughs> yeah, exactly. we're going to go to Mars. That. I'm sure we can <laughs> fix this mess. of garden design or uh, architecture or the areas that you sort of cover what are the like are there key things that you think do make a real difference is it where you source products from is it um yeah there's a lot of key aspects yeah. uh, you know everything that's recyclable is is, is a must mm -hmm. um obviously trying to uh, source as locally as possible makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense mm -hmm. and then on for example on the on on the on your if you build a home how much energy does that act, does that house actually consume? Mm -hmm. We never used to ask ourselves that question, mm -hmm. and I think most people, a lot of people, don't ask that question. Mm -hmm. But you do ask it when you buy a car. Mm -hmm. You're very conscious of, you know, how many liters does that car use per hundred kilometers? Mm -hmm. It's a standard question. Mm -hmm. But we don't ask ourselves how much does this house consume to run mm -hmm. over a, a, a year period. Mm -hmm. And it's shocking some of the houses that get built, of how much they actually cost to run because they're built so inefficiently. 
it's like trying to heat up, you know, putting a radiator outside for some of the houses that they're built so badly. <laughs> yes. Or trying to cool, you know, the cool, cool, you know, with the air conditioning, trying to cool an outside space, and if it doesn't work, you have to you have to build it well, so you don't, so it's not so difficult to heat and cool. And would you say those original building methods, that there's definitely things to learn, I mean, from what you see, I mean, there were some... The original building, I mean, there's a lot of great things from yeah. the old building yeah. methods, but I think it kind of changed a lot, uh, you know, when, we, when the kind of the classic breeze block came yeah. in and things like that, it's like, it works as a functional thing, but it's not really very energy efficient environmentally, a lot of them are like, not very good. Um, so, in relation to going back in time, I, mean, I think there were certain building methods that had been tried and tested over hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and then that kind of got lost. Mm -hmm. And then now we're starting to kind of have an interest in it and kind of go back and try to figure out how, that, how they came to those conclusions. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And similar, I think, to restore, you know, uh, retaining water. Um, I, you know, old te technologies were, mm. were very good at that. I guess new, new, you know, we've been more wasteful. Is that the technology, I guess, you're using, introducing, finding new ways to collect the water, reuse the water? I mean, we also, what kind of, of rainwater, rainwater harvesting is a must. Uh, recycling black and grey water is a must. Mm -hmm. And then, for example, with irrigation systems, with using kind of, really kind of high-end quality irrigation so you can you can save an enormous amount of water mm -hmm. and with humidity sensors and efficient pumps there's a lot that you can do on on that side mm -hmm. but first is to start do the recycling process and then how that's used within you know a garden is is, is another factor mm -hmm. or or within the house you know how much you know, the, the consumption is your, your shower Mm -hmm. How much water does your shower use, or, mm -hmm. or, or, or the taps and things like that? Yeah, I guess as a garden designer, that's uh, <laughs> that, that, that's uh, it, it's you know it's not like other parts of the world where maybe you know water isn't such a a, a challenging subject or a, a difficult situation. So yeah, as a garden designer, I guess you're really conscious about what you're what you're putting in, and probably dependent on the location of the property or the water yeah, source. Yeah, I, mean, I, I look into the environmental factors. I study that that deeply, but then I have to find that balance in between what the client wants yeah. and how I can guide the client to, you know, the, the best possible outcome. And so, if a client, you know, is adamant that he has to have a bit of lawn, well, I say, well, let's 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 keep it small, mm -hmm. and we'll go for certain varieties. That there's one called Pasparum, for example, that you can literally water it with sea salt. It's it, it's very very tolerant and mm -hmm. very hardy. Okay, in the winter it goes a bit yellow, mm -hmm. but in the summer it looks nice and nice and green, and mm -hmm. that's kind of how I can strike that balance between the client's wishes mm -hmm. and uh, you know uh, my my kind of gentle guiding them and has to find it, that medium ground, mm -hmm. and then we can, for example, with that lawn we can water it with uh, recycled water, with black and grey water that we can um, use an underground irrigation system. So all the water that been, they've been using in the house, we can reuse that for, for example, the lawn, mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. So it kind of works. Yeah, exploring ways to to meet, I, and and that is a, that is a challenge. I mean, that's a real challenge, you know. And I think you know, maybe sometimes think, am I in, in the right, you know, job? Because it really contra you know, it conflicts with with your beliefs. But there must there is a place for people like you mm -hmm. um, because you're educating and you're pushing the boundaries and you're. Along the way, you're you know trying to bring people closer to a vision that you think is more um, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, it's just trying to find that medium ground. For example, if if a client wants a, a wooden floor or a wooden decking, I'll say okay, we can go for the classic hardwood, mm -hmm. but let's be conscious of where that hardwood comes from, comes from, uh, and then give them an alternative, which you can use um, bamboo decking, mm -hmm. which is like compressed bamboo. It's harder than mm -hmm. any hardwood. And it grows in, in three months instead of 90 years. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good option. Yeah. And I've definitely seen this trend of people. Um, uh, yeah, 
reclaiming farmland. I, I think well, farming, you know, would have been, mm. I guess, very strong when you when you you were young. I, I was at the kind of I saw the end of that era. Yeah, I I remember seeing you know the horse and cart, the donkey plowing the fields and things like that. And those kind of literally you no know, tractors. Mm -hmm. um, Ibiza was. It, I, well, I saw, yeah, I saw kind of the decline of an era that had, had finished, but prior to that, prior to 1950, mm -hmm. this island was just, it was, it was, most of the island was farm. There was hardly actually any pine forests. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so a lot of the, old, the, the pine forests that you see now, if you go for a walk and you kind of walk through it, you'll see it's full of old terraces. Yeah, That's of course. It's really, really beautiful. And the, it is coming back slowly, I think, mm -hmm. the, the, the farming aspect. I'm I'm seeing a, a, a big trend in that. So I guess what would happen is the younger generation weren't so enthused as you know, or they they, they left the, the island oh, they the, didn't take on the traditions or the demands. Well, I think this, the tourism boom started. So it was the, you know the tourism boom yes. started. So from you know going out and slogging from you know six in the morning till midnight, which in those yeah. days they worked extremely hard, to suddenly you know being able to have a little hotel or, or, or and work. Mm -hmm a lot less and, and a lot more mm -hmm. it was just like there was it was just a, as if the tap had been closed they just it was pretty much abandoned mm -hmm. the farming aspect from within a very short period mm -hmm. yeah and 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 as i say i do think it's coming back i think um it's a big reason i mean there's many reasons i'm here but there's something delicious about the uh the produce that, that you get that's very different to a, a tomato you might pick in england or you know <laughs> well almost doesn't exist in england i, don't. I remember being really <laughs> shocked actually because when i went well, i was 11 when i went to live in, in england and my mum bought some tomatoes and i kind of just went and bit into it and i said this isn't a tomato <laughs> like, what is it it's like cardboard uh, but, yeah, it's true. It, it, it is true, and there's, but there, there's an abundance. It's seemingly an abundance. Certainly more, and a big movement to protect, reclaim. Yeah. Uh, is that stuff you're you're seeing? You evolve. Yeah, in, like, see, that, that, the land? there's a lot of. I think there is a big shift. Yeah, a lot of clients of mine definitely want to, you know, start farming a certain aspect of their land or fixing the old terraces and mm -hmm. planting it up with fig trees or mm -hmm. almond trees or olives or mm -hmm. carob trees. It's very beautiful as well to kind of look at. Mm -hmm. And you get you can get your olive oil, Absolutely. Your figs and things like that. And then there's the the classic farming in the sense of you know farming watermelons and honey melons and tomatoes and things like that. I'd be a massive fan of uh, <laughs> watermelons in my garden. <laughs> that would be that would be a great thing to to pull out the ground. Yeah, I'm seeing this trend of people coming here to, I guess like your parents did to live a, a new way of a new way of living. Obviously, it's very different to when they came. But there seems to be people trying to seek a new way of living. And, and what you sort of touched on before about if policy can change, you know, there is a, uh, an opportunity for the island to be an example mm -hmm. um, that can hopefully inspire others. Is, is that something you see? Are there, are there people sort of collecting, having conversations on, on, on a level that you think, you know, we, sh we should be looking at or supporting? I think if you look at, it, 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 speaking about Ibiza itself, if you look at its history, it's always been an island of, kind of, of poets and artists mm -hmm. open-minded people uh, and a place to kind of let loose and be free and, and that I don't think will ever change it's the energy of the island it's Ibiza you know it still attracts that and that won't won't go so um, on on that aspect I think that um, it will it will just keep on playing out in in in, in, diff in different ways and, and different formulas and, and will we'll kind of it, it kind of gives it lends itself to having a kind of a more open mind or a more bro broader vision of life and it's still a very unique place mm -hmm. to live yeah and, mm -hmm. and you can it's got that balance of everything I think mm -hmm. it's got a bit of madness if you like that it, 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 you can live, you can be completely secluded if you prefer being a, a hermit mm -hmm. or if you want to be you know, a, 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 a businessman or an entrepreneur you can do it on this side and it kind of it opens itself up to to many different realms um, it's also interesting to know when you're not at Terra Vita when you're not working here when you're not visioning does that how do you what would you do? What do you, do you, do you enjoy doing on the island? Or I like going for walks. Yeah. Uh, in the winter, I, I like uh, just kind of walking along the coasts or, or 
finding uh, and exploring old ruins. If you still got, they used to have lots of old ruins. There's hardly any left, mm -hmm. but there, but there used to be. Yeah, there used to be quite a few. And when you go to those old farms, you can see how life used to be. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. It was like a, it, it, the way they used to function. It was like a little mini town in a, in a mini house in that sense. It's very, very, very interesting. Um, what else do I like doing there? I'm a bit of a hermit. I know. She's, <laughs> she's just reading and going for walks and things like that. Well, it's a beautiful. It's a definitely a beautiful way to spend the day. And I think once you uh, uh, remove yourself from the busy, busy lifestyle, um, that the, I certainly remember that transition from London to to a, to a slow Mediterranean mm -hmm. lifestyle. You present yourself with lots of time to read and relax, and mm -hmm. and, and that, that seems to be, you know, something you just want to do. You yes. know? I mean, there's, there's something just beautiful about the simplicity. So I, I, I resonate with that. Uh, I try not to fill my life with too much um, mm. uh, other, other stuff. And I also have got uh, an electric bicycle, which is great. great because you don't die when you go up a hill. You <laughs> yeah, you've got that option. Of, you kind of arrive there with you being able to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great fun kind of jumping on the bike and going down old shepherd's paths and you know, all, all around the island. That's the, that's no? Right yeah, no, I, I'm sure. Uh, and um, is there a... Is there a memory? Is there a smell? Is there a certain thing about Ibiza that when you you can still come into contact now that sort of transports you to old times? Is there an area of the island, or is there anything that you think really? I love it when it when it after you get those big rains at the end of the summer, the mm -hmm. smell of the kind of the, the the rain in the pine trees. That's that's, that's something I love I really, that. I actually I love, love that. that. I really like that smell. It's, it's uh, yeah, that's that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, you know, we've, thank you so much. You, you've answered a lot. You've given me a lot. You've taught me a lot, which is, which is always really, really nice. Um, so I'm really, really happy to connect with you. We've got mutual clients, which is, um, and I know for anyone who's come into contact with you, particularly on a much closer level, mm -hmm. uh, you know, seeing the level of detail that goes into your work, mm -hmm. um, your innovation, right from the concept and your involvement from the concept to the execution. Mm -hmm. I know our plant speaks so, so very highly of you, so I really, really appreciate your time. I know you, uh, you're juggling a lot of projects as well as keeping your vision strong. So I really appreciate you taking the time. Pleasure. Thank, Thank you so pleasure. much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>